It is time for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning, and we will start with listed questions. I call Mr. Cackle O'Sheen. Uh, question one, please. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I have had uh, ongoing discussions with Ulster University in relation to the possible implications of the budget reductions to the higher education sector, including proposed uh, course closures and the potential impacts on staffing budgets. While my department provides funding and sets the, the strategic direction for the higher education sector, universities are autonomous and responsible for their own course provision and staffing levels. During these discussions, I, I have highlighted the need to reflect the ambitions of the executive and the objectives of my department, including the, the protection of narrow STEM subjects. To provide the university with some flexibility and to help mitigate the impact of the budget reduction, I have reduced the minimum requirement for direct expenditure and widening participation to 10 per cent of the additional student fee income. This reinvestment of student fee income is undertaken to promote widening participation through outreach activities and support to less advantaged students. The university will, ra will rationalise its offerings across the campuses with Coleraine specialising in biosciences and McGee in computing, engineering and Irish history. The university has already indicated the scale of the job losses and the loss of places over the current academic year and over future years. The size of these cuts is a clear indication of the severity of the budget reductions faced by, by my department, the university and the higher education sector. Before making decisions regarding course provision and staffing levels, the university has taken a number of factors into account, including my department's priorities, needs of the economy and student demand. Reviewing course provision is part of the, of the normal annual cycle and is good business practice. It is a reflection of the current budget position that this has led to Ulster University to close some courses and consolidate others. Mr. Oshin for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. Can the Minister be more specific about the job losses that are involved here and also the placements that will be lost as well? Well, the university themselves have made announcements in that regard. So they have published and announced the numbers of jobs that are going on, the places that are going on, and the courses. I can list all of those for the member, but it would take a while, given that we are talking a severe situation. But those are freely available for the member's information. Call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the minister for his answer. While the minister says that the universities have autonomy. Surely he, as Minister, has a greater responsibility to ensure that the uh, equality issues and the economy of the area where the uh, universities exist is of paramount importance. And could he explain to this House, for goodness sake, what is the rationale in bringing the Kelvin project in at Port Rush, allegedly to create thousands of new jobs, and at the same time the Department for Business Studies is virtually closing? Well, I have to say to the member, there's not a lot of rationales for a lot of things that, that are happening at, at present. I mean, we are in a, a very poor state of affairs, both in terms of our governance and decisions that we've been taking, or rather not taking, uh, around uh, budgets. And uh, we are seeing the outworkings of that in terms of what's happening, not just to universities, but also to further education and other skill interventions, and outside my own department, a whole host of other uh, pu uh, pu public services. It is worth stressing again that universities are uh, autonomous. We can give guidance. They are aware of the executive's uh, direction of travel in this regard. But we do need to be very careful about micro micromanaging them. And it would be very easy to come in and say, well, actually, you should protect uh, courses uh, and uh, jobs at this campus uh, or that campus or protect certain uh, particular types uh, of, of, of course uh, themselves. However, in doing that, we have to recognise that, um, very regrettably, we have had the pass on cuts uh, to universities. And quite rightly, they will come back and say, well, if you don't think we should be cutting in that particular area, then where do you want us to cut? Uh, we have to trust them uh, to, to make the, the decisions based upon the evidence and, and the host of factors that I have indicated in, in, the main, in the main answer. And whatever way they do this, we are going to have a very unpalatable outcome. Call Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I think the university has actually taken this decision entirely in isolation, which is unacceptable considering a, a significant amount of the money they receive is from the public purse. Um, I also think the decision to take the Ulster Business School up to McGee is also um, quite ridiculous, and I think this executive has a responsibility to actually start looking at the decisions that are affecting my constituents and the other constituents of the peop of people representing in this House. Would the Minister therefore consider reintroducing a higher education funding council for the future of Northern Ireland as seen in other parts of the United Kingdom? 
Well, if we were to go down that line, uh, that would add uh, another layer of, of bureaucracy uh, and would actually divert um, scarce resources away from the front line and make the situation uh, even worse. Um, the reason that there are uh, funding councils in England Scotland is due to the, the scale of their societies and the number of universities that they have. We have three universities and also the six FE colleges in Northern Ireland engaging in higher education and operating that scale. There is the, the, the same case uh, for the creation of a body uh, such uh, as, as HEFCA. And, uh, so it's in, in that regard, I think we need to have a, a sense of balance and perspective. Well, Mrs. Sander, over end. Uh, members will be aware that the two reports I commissioned on initial teacher education infrastructure, the Grant Thornton study and Aspiring to Excellence, confirmed that the status quo is unsustainable from both a financial and qualitative perspective. For example, year on year we continue to train too many teachers for jobs that do not exist, primarily to sustain the current institutional configuration. Aspiring to Excellence have provided alternatives to the current structure which could enable initial teacher education to be delivered more cost effectively and to a world class standard. In my view, the option uh, which best achieves this is a single institution which will enable increased sharing and integration and provide a, re a research-rich environment in line with best international practice, though I remain open to alternatives that are financially sustainable. Such an approach would include provision for the respective ethos of the university colleges to be not only accommodated but embraced, as has been achieved in other places such as Dublin and Glasgow. My officials and I are currently considering a number of options and will initiate further engagement with the providers and the wider education sector to find an agreed way forward. I hope to say more about this shortly about, uh, with regard to our next steps. Call Ms. Zoverend for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his response. With regard uh, to available teacher training places, the Minister is on record as describing the current system of having the teacher demand model topped up by education ministers as politically motivated, and I quote, are a racket. What progress has been made in ensuring the, the ability of Sinn Féin ministers to act in a blatantly sectarian manner is stopped? Well, I, I certainly uh, understand the point uh, that the, the member uh, is, is making, though it perhaps wouldn't maybe express it in, in the, the terms that she ha has, has done. However, the, the numbers do remain a, a, a matter for the Minister uh, of, of Education, and uh, he will take uh, his decisions uh, based upon a, a number of, uh, of factors. Um, my, my views on the issue um, are uh, already uh, well known, and I do not think it is a sustainable uh, way forward. And, and frankly, it is uh, a very sad state of affairs that we are training too many teachers for our local economy whenever we know the jobs aren't there uh, for them. And that diverts what are incredibly scarce resources away from other areas of the economy, areas, for example, that we've just been talking about in the previous uh, set of questions. And it is appropriate that we, we do find some consensus in this assembly uh, for a much more sustainable way forward for teacher education that not, not only serves the future needs of our education system, but actually allows resources to, to be freed up to invest in other critical skills and interventions. It is bizarre that we have a situation where it costs more in Northern Ireland to train a teacher, uh, when arguably we have too many, and than it does to, to, and, uh, than it does to train an engineer whenever we have too few engineers. So we, we have to get our priorities straight. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, previously the committee was aware of the number of options you had in going forward to try and get a, a resolution between uh, Stan Millis and St Mary's. Can the Minister assure the House that he will compromise his own position to try and get a consensual uh, way forward to ensure that the ethos and management of both colleges remains intact? Well, at the moment, we don't see much um, overlap in terms of the different uh, views that are coming forward uh, from the, the institutions. We've had um, three institutions uh, say that they are in favour of, of the, the options under uh, aspiring to excellence, including a particular um, option D. Um, St Mary's themselves, uh, while open uh, to, to cooperation, uh, it's only right that I do, I do say that, however, have rejected all of the options set out uh, in, in the report. Um, so, that, so therefore, we, we are, to, to a certain extent, currently uh, in a bit of an impasse in, in this situation. However, the underlying issues are still there. Uh, we have a very costly and fragmented uh, system. 
Uh, we are still uh, training a large number of our teachers uh, on a divided uh, basis, uh, which sends out a terrible signal uh, to the future of our education system. And while our pr pr uh, provision is of good quality, it is not keeping up with pace in terms of international uh, developments, and in due course that will be felt in terms of the quality uh, of our education system. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, Given the executive decision uh, to protect the Premier uh, for teacher training colleges, can the Minister tell us what are the consequences out of it for uh, the, the education and, and training aspects in Northern Ireland? Well, as, as the, the Assembly will know, I had proposed uh, the removal of the, the premia, um, the, the, the specialist premia from uh, the teacher um, uh, training uh, colleges. Um, they are the only ones in receipt of, of those uh, very particular uh, payments. The effect of those is to very much to skew uh, our provision in terms of, of, of higher education. The resources. Um, the decision that was, that was taken from the executive meant that what would have otherwise been a £14 million cut uh, to the higher education sector uh, became a £16 million cut. Uh, that, will have, well, that will have had an effect on the number of places and the number of jobs that have now had to go in terms of our universities. In the context that we had been able to do things differently, uh, we would have had fewer job losses and fewer courses uh, being dropped. Call Mr Daphne Mackay. Best ever a tree. Question number three. Uh, during the budget negotiations, um, I secured an additional £20 million to support skills development, which alleviated the budget reduction to further and higher education. The further education budget has been reduced uh, by £12 million, uh, which uh, follows on from £4 million annual efficiencies required in recent years. To help address the budget cuts, colleges have utilised the voluntary exit scheme, which, uh, with excess of over 400 college staff. I have tried to ensure that frontline services are protected as far as possible. Inevitably, the required cuts will have implications for the provision offered. Colleges are estimating that there will be approximately 20,000 fewer funded part-time enrolments. Approximately half of these are recreational courses. Colleges are increasing fees for recreational courses to mitigate the cuts. Looking forward, the new strategy for further education extends and reaffirms the role of further education colleges as engines of the economy through skills. The higher education institutions' budgets reduced by £16.1 million, and they have made savings over the past four years amounting to £37 million. I also released around £8 million in spending power over coming years to the universities by reducing the minimum level of reinvestment in widening participation programmes from 20 to 10 per cent of additional student fee income. The universities have acted to protect the narrow STEM subjects, which are essential for our future economic growth and prosperity. However, they have had to reduce the number of undergraduate places and have launched early severance and voluntary exit schemes. As higher education funding from government continues to decline, it is therefore clear that our funding model is unsustainable. Therefore, I have launched the, big, the higher education big conversation to involve as many people as possible in shaping our own unique solution to supporting higher education going forward. Once complete, I will take stock of all options and present them to the Executive. Call Mr Mackay for supplementary. Can I ask the Minister can I thank the Minister for, for his response, but can I ask him for an update on his discussions with the university sector uh, to explore ways of raising additional uh, revenue without detrimentally affecting students? Well, there's a lot of work that's ongoing uh, already in terms of business and community uh, interaction, and, and it is worth noting that our uh, local universities perform extremely well in terms of the UK context and certainly punch well above their weight in terms of areas such as um, consultancy knowledge, transfer uh, issues, uh, spin out companies, all those types of, of, of indicators. Where perhaps um, there is greater scope for uh, growth is in relation to how we do uh, from bids in terms of, uh, of uh, UK research councils. The difficulty there is that we are um, battling uh, what is a trend towards the consolidation of big scale research projects into fewer and fewer uh, universities, uh, particularly as um, scale becomes an important consideration in terms of, of these projects. Uh, plus, we have the issue of, of being on a different island and what, often what is happening elsewhere uh, in, in the UK. So that makes the challenge uh, almost double in terms of what we, what we have to do. But nonetheless, uh, that is an area where more work uh, can, can be done. 
We also have the potential to access uh, European uh, funding, uh, and great work is, is, is happening in terms of putting in bids in relation to Horizon 2020. And, uh, as a member will be aware, we have a contact uh, point network in place across my department and also uh, DETI with support from a number of other uh, government departments with uh, people employed solely with the purpose of processing grant applications uh, to the European Union. And beyond that, we also have the, um, the, the, the North-South cooperation uh, with Dell and uh, SF and also the US Ireland Research Alliance, all of which are other ways in which we can bring additional money into uh, our higher education sector. I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister's efforts to address the funding difficulties be made much easier if many of his colleagues in the Executive uh, did not adopt a head in the sand attitude, uh, particularly with approach to finance, including welfare reform? And does he regret now? not voting for the current year's budget? Um, well, well, first of all, um, let me say first uh, that we do have to press on with, with welfare reform. Uh, that is of, of primary uh, importance. But I have to say uh, to, to the member as well, uh, but the situation would have been helped a little bit as well if the decision had not been taken by the executive uh, regarding the reallocation uh, of the, the, uh, the premium uh, cuts that I had uh, proposed uh, to the teacher training colleges and his own party uh, were very much party uh, to uh, that, that, that decision. Um, overall, um, my, my, my own party uh, did take a view that we weren't in support uh, of uh, the budget. Uh, we took a, a part in a democratic decision uh, in that regard uh, because we didn't feel that the budget was sufficiently uh, strategic. However, once that decision has been taken, uh, we have honourably followed through with the decisions that have uh, been, been taken in terms of supporting uh, the legislation uh, around all of that and ensuring that our departments uh, remain within the budget envelope that has um, been allocated to us. Unfortunately, I don't think those comments apply to the conduct uh, of his own party uh, whenever they were in office until fairly recently. Call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Speaker, uh, Minister, you'll be aware that a number of job losses are imminent uh, next year, not least being Q in my own constituency. H what efforts are being made with your, with your big conversation around colleges for those people who find themselves somewhat later in life to be out of work during that time? And how will those training opportunities or services that are usually availed of through the colleges be, be ring fenced for the future for those people who need that type of upskilling? Well, I have to say to the member, it's, it's very difficult to contemplate ring fencing anything in terms of the, the current uh, climate because uh, real carnage is happening in terms of our budgets around skills to both our universities and uh, to our, our colleges. But let me stress that our, our colleges in particular uh, are there uh, to engage directly in the upskilling of the workforce. Uh, it is a service that is um, all, all age. They will work directly uh, with companies as well in terms of putting together some very particular uh, training uh, programs, as well as the, the more general provision uh, that they offer. They're also the, uh, the key delivery partners in relation to our new strategy uh, around um, apprenticeships. Um, and we, we also have the, the uh, beyond the, what the colleges offer, um, redundancy services where we can put together particular clinics and with particular reference to, to B&Q, uh, that offer is there in relation to direct assistance that we can provide uh, to any individuals who are very sadly being made redundant uh, in that context. I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, President Privy Speaker. Minister, thank you for your, your answers so far. Minister, could you uh, set out for the House what your vision would be for uh, uh, the appropriate finances required to deliver the world-class further and higher education that we all aspire to? Well, in, in terms of finance, uh, it is worth referencing where we, where we currently uh, sit in this context. Um, we have had a, a cut in terms of the, this current financial year in the region of uh, £16 million. Uh, that builds on top of what has, has been an emerging uh, structural deficit for our universities, approximating to £40 million. These are all uh, per annum uh, costs. Um, that amounts to a difference um, in terms of funding per place in Northern Ireland with the rest of the UK of between £1,000 and £2,500, which is, is a, a very significant um, difference. And uh, if not addressed, will call into question uh, the quality of our uh, higher education product compared uh, to others. So there's a very real danger there. 
On top of that, we have uh, quite understandable demands for the expansion of the higher education sector, particularly with reference uh, to the McGee campus in Derry. And if that were to go ahead, we're talking uh, an additional, again, per annum commitment uh, from the executive in the region of about £30 uh, million. Pounds. So very quickly, you see that we have a funding pressure for higher education um, in excess of £80 million pounds, uh, per year. Now, in terms of the future system, we are not simply proposing that we carry on as before. We do need to see a rebalancing and a reprofiling of our higher education offer. We do need to see a greater shift towards STEM subjects. We need to see a greater shift towards um, engaging in, in the provision of employability skills. Our universities are also potential partners in terms of our apprenticeship strategy, in particular around uh, degree level um, apprenticeships. Uh, which uh, taken into account part-time study alongside someone being part of a job and training um, within, within that, uh, that particular uh, context. That is a very tall order, however, in terms of the amount of money that uh, we are talking about. But it is something that is achievable if we are prepared to do things differently across a whole range of aspects of how we are conducting business in Northern Ireland, uh, from addressing the cost of a divided society through to revenue raising, uh, through to uh, other reforms in key public services. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I got uh, Kirsty Cahar. Question four, please. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I wish to group questions four and ten. I would like to request an additional minute for the answer. Northern Ireland currently supports higher education through a roughly equal balance between public and private investment. In 2013 and 14, the higher education institutions' two most significant sources of income came from annual grants paid through government departments. Uh, amounting to 37% of their income, and tuition fees paid by students representing 30%. This year, in the context of, of severely constrained public resources, grant funding for higher education in Northern Ireland is reducing by over 16 million. Meanwhile, tuition fees have remained frozen, subject only to inflationary increases since 2006. The stifling of investment has led to, to significant reductions in student places and staff posts. We are now the only region in the UK actively disinvesting in higher education. The model we currently use to support higher education is no longer sustainable. This is why I have launched an innovative and experimental approach to engage with the people of Northern Ireland about this extremely important issue, entitled the Higher Education Big Conversation. The first stage of the Big Conversation closed on Friday the 2nd of October. It was designed to inform or remind people about why higher education is so important and how it is delivered and funded. It also explored the challenges our higher education system is facing and drew on the ways in which higher education is delivered and funded elsewhere. Parents, organisations, employers, employees, former higher education students and current students tested their knowledge during the first stages of the process. Stage 2, entitled Have Your Say, closes on Friday the 23rd of October and provides the people of Northern Ireland with the opportunity to help shape the future of higher education here. I will be using ev evidence uh, uh, gathered from this exercise to formulate an options paper, which, uh, which I will be presenting to my executive colleagues, outlining the ways in which higher education could be sustained in the future. Call Mr. Sheehan for a supplementary. I wonder, could the minister tell us uh, when he expects to have uh, conversations with representatives of political parties as part of these discussions? Well, that, that, that stage formally will come through engagement with the committee, um, which does represent I think, all of the parties uh, in the, the Assembly, and also with uh, members uh, of, of the executive. Ultimately, the executive will be the key decision maker in this regard. If any party wishes to have a, a separate meeting uh, with uh, my, myself or indeed with my officials regarding these issues, we are more than happy to facilitate that directly in, in advance of those of more formal discussions. Call Mr. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware that the funding gap between Northern Ireland universities and universities in Great Britain is growing. So, can he assure the House that his big conversation about higher education is not a device to put off making a decision while the funding gap continues to grow? Well, it's certainly not uh, designed uh, to put anything off. This is designed to bring things to a head because the, the, the current situation is not sustainable and a decision has to, to be taken um, on the, the, way, the way forward. Um, I am very keen to hear the views of the Ulster Unionist Party in terms of what they believe is the way forward. Uh, ultimately, this will have to be a decision that is taken by the executive. This has to be a collective uh, decision uh, that all of us uh, are able to stand over and to embed for several generations. 
We can't have a situation where our universities are facing an unstable environment where they're, liver, they're living from pillar to post from one, one year to another or from one spending round uh, to, to another. We need to have this issue settled so that they can plan ahead for the future and also our future students have certainty as to what they are facing in terms of the decisions that they make around uh, how they, they're going to approach their studies. Call Ms. Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. You've suggested that the current model is unsustainable. Has the Department identified the tipping point uh, after which they think the model will be unworkable financially? And at this stage, do you envisage a change in the number of colleges and NI campuses? Well, at, at this stage, um, the, the situation is clearly already uh, unsustainable. Whenever we have a situation where we're actively losing um, places where we're actively losing staff, uh, where we are going in the opposite direction to what's happening el elsewhere in, in these islands. Up until that point, we had actually been making progress in uh, what was gradual incremental uh, change in the terms of, uh, in terms of the number of places that we've had in our, our universities. And we've actually managed to increase by almost 1,400 1, um, over the lifetime of, of this uh, assembly, uh, which has been a, a significant rate uh, of progress. We're now moving backwards uh, in that regard. The second point the member makes is in relation to colleges and NI and the, the number of FE colleges in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, the intention is that we will continue to have six, and that's not something that's, that's on, on, on the agenda. Obviously, as we, we work through the capital um, programme for colleges, we may see some decisions around rationalisation uh, of, of particular uh, buildings, um, but th th we are committed to having six uh, colleges within our FE network. Call Mr David McNary. Question 5, Principal Deputy Speaker. An increase in national insurance numbers issued does not necessarily lead to an increase in the numbers not in employment, education or training. A report commissioned by the Department of Work and Pensions and authored by Portis, Lemos and Gilpin showed that there is no, is no impact on the numbers not in employment, education or training related to the number of migrants registering for national insurance numbers in the UK. <clears throat> it should be noted that not all those issued with national insurance numbers outside the routine process where individuals are 16 years old may be working. It should also be noted that some of those issued with national insurance numbers, although not UK born, will be UK citizens. Northern Ireland Social Security Agency and the Department for Work and Pension Statistics show that there were between 8,000 and 11,000 national insurance numbers issued to non-UK nationals resident in Northern Ireland in each of the last four years. This is around half of the annual level for the period between 2005 and 2008. It would be unwise to assume a causal link between the claimant count and the national insurance number registrations. Migrants will leave at any one time, uh, not, have, not, not all will have jobs, and some will be UK citizens, even if not UK born. It is therefore important not to draw conclusions about whether non UK born national insurance number registrations increase or decrease the number of those not in employment, education, or training. Well, Mr. McNary, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I Thank the Minister for his answer. I, I asked the question to inform opinion makers. Would the Minister uh, tell me what sort of grip, as opposed to speculation, does the Minister's own department have on the relationship between these high immigrant figures and the number of jobs available to local young people aged 16 to 24, 32,000 of whom are not in employment, education or training? Well, I certainly hope that the member uh, will inform uh, the people of Northern Ireland as to what is really going on, rather than engaging in scaremongering and scapegoating of people coming into our society. Mr. Order, order. I ask Mr. McCarth, Mr. McNary to remain seated, not to be badgering from the back row. I think most people in the society are sick, sore, and tired of the democracy that comes from UKIP about scapegoating the other for the problems that lie within our society. Let, let me state the facts as they stand. We have situations where we have problems with unemployment, we have problems with low and no skills. These are deep structural problems that have existed in our society long before mass migration became an issue in terms of this society. 
The same applies in terms of what people perceive, problems in terms of admissions to schools and also problems with waiting lists. These are nothing to do with the fact that people are coming to work and live in Northern Ireland. They relate to problems around our budgets, they relate to structural issues within our, within our society that we have not yet come to grips with. The fact remains that we have seen our unemployment, including long-term unemployment and economic inactivity, persist regardless of the ups and downs of the economic cycle and the numbers of people coming in to Northern Ireland. Those are the facts. The statistics are there, and I'm more than happy to give those to Mr McNary, particularly if he is committing himself to actually informing people about the facts rather than the perceptions and the fears that people wish, wish to stoke up for, for potential political, political gain. Let's not scapegoat economic migrants. Let's welcome into North, them into Northern Ireland and recognise that they are playing a major role in our society. And they are adding more to our society than they are taking out. And let me even just make one example about our National Health Service in Northern Ireland that would not exist and would not function if it was not for people Minister's who come time to is up. from other parts of the world. Minister's time is up. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Mr. Neil Somerville. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister for an update on the disability employment strategy? Um, yes, I'm more than happy to give the, the member uh, an update, though it was only uh, two weeks since we have actually uh, launched uh, the, the strategy, so the consultation uh, is still underway. But the, the member, um, please, given, uh, given his uh, political allegiance, I'm sure he would be, be particularly pleased that I was uh, down at uh, Croke Park this morning uh, for the National Disability Authority conference in terms of, 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 of uh, opportunities around employment. And it is worth noting that uh, what we have done in Northern Ireland has also been mirrored in the employment strategy that was launched by the Taoiseach uh, in the, on the 2nd of October, the same week we launched our strategy in Northern Ireland. Mr Somerville for supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, would there be any timeline on the implementation of this, the bill, please? Well, the, the, the intention would be that we would have the formal strategy in place early in 2016, uh, once we have uh, formally concluded the consultation process and collated all of the, all of the responses. However, there are aspects of it that we can proceed with uh, already, and the member will be uh, probably pleased to note that we have uh, uh, proceeded through disability action to begin recruiting the supported employment officers. Well, Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the idea of grant parental leave for childcare? Um, well, at this stage, it's, it's very early days, given that this was only announced uh, last week at the Conservative uh, Party uh, conference. Uh, in principle, it does seem to be a, a positive uh, idea. As the member will know, we've only this year introduced that shared parental leave, uh, obviously in relation uh, to parents. Uh, that's been in place since the beginning of, of April uh, th this year. Uh, it, it would take fresh legislation in this uh, assembly. Uh, but, however, if it is the view um, of the member and indeed other par parties, uh, I'm sure that there would be uh, a strong basis on which we could proceed to introduce legislation along similar lines uh, of any legislation that would be introduced for Great Britain. Dobson, first supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'm glad that the Minister is aware of the Chancellor's announcement at, at Westminster. Notwithstanding the need to recognise the primary childcare responsibilities of both fathers and mothers, will the Minister ensure that Northern Ireland keeps pace with the rest of the UK with regard to this policy area? Yes, I'm, I'm certainly uh, very much aware of the importance uh, of ensuring that people in Northern Ireland get full advantage uh, of uh, such uh, pr provision. And again, I would just uh, join in the member in stressing the, the importance that whenever we talk about whether it's shared parental leave or potential um, shared uh, gra grandparental parental leave, that this is all about voluntary participation uh, and enabling uh, people. It's about recognising the different nature of, of the modern uh, family. Uh, the fact that uh, often we have uh, two parents that are, that are working, or indeed single parents in the case of the grandparent co context, that, that, that may be working. And there may be a whole host of economic and social reasons uh, why people wish to uh, share um, the, the leave available to them uh, in, in different ways. Uh, it's not about forcing people to move away from perhaps a more traditional model, if that's what uh, particular families uh, prefer, but essentially widening choice. This is also something that's very much um, 
that has a, a very strong economic rationale. This is about um, companies investing in their staff and ensuring that they are treating them with, with respect. And there will be a productivity gain that comes uh, on, on the back of this uh, to, to uh, all, all employers uh, who obviously uh, are required to go along with the, 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 uh, the, new, the new legal framework. Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, Albert. Does the Minister accept that the cuts to the tax credit system will result in fewer people being able to take up employment if indeed they are far enough to secure a position? Yes, I mean, I'm opposed to what is happening in terms of, of uh, tax credits. As the member will know, however, it is something that's happening uh, on a non-devolved basis um, through, through Westminster. And uh, it's incumbent, therefore, on MPs who are there. Uh, and that, uh, obviously, potentially can include the member's own uh, elected representatives uh, to stand up for the very particular circumstances of Northern Ireland whenever decisions are being taken uh, in that, re that regard. Um, obviously, the member will also be aware that we have a talks process on, underway where the issue of, of welfare uh, is under uh, consideration. That point is being brought up uh, from a number uh, of, different, of different sources. Um, there is a lot of consideration also been given to uh, steps that can be put in place to mitigate the effects of welfare reform in terms of ensuring that we are investing in employability schemes, that we are investing in how we give people uh, proper opportunities uh, to uh, engage with the world of work and also to sustain employment. McAleer for supplementary. Does the, thank you, Minister, for the Does the Minister accept that whilst the increase in the minimum wage will go some way to help and relieve the conditions of people living in poverty, that it doesn't go far enough to counter the negative impacts of the cuts to the tax credit system? Um, yeah, the, the increases in minimum wage and the, in due course, the, the so-called um, living, living wage approach, uh, to an extent, uh, will mitigate those, though obviously not fully, and th there will be differential impact at four for, 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 di for different people uh, in that regard. We also have to factor in what was going to be the potential implications in terms of, of employment levels in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, while um, I think there is a very clear uh, national consensus on the way to go in terms of uh, additional support for people who are in work through what, what, what they're earning. We also need to be conscious of the potential impacts, uh, particularly for SMEs, uh, and we have a, pr a predominance of uh, SMEs within our, within our own local economy. Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I understand the Minister uh, attended the National Disability Authority Conference in Dublin this morning. Can I ask the Minister to let us know what his participation was about? Well, um, like uh, Northern Ireland, uh, other um, parts of these islands uh, are also looking at the, the support they provide uh, to people uh, with uh, disabilities. Uh, this involves a whole range uh, of, uh, of public services and also the, the type of infrastructure that we have. But there's also a, an increased focus around em employability. Um, I was there to, to share um, our experiences in Northern Ireland over the past number of years in terms of how we have sought to support uh, people with disabilities into the world of work and how we can help them to sustain uh, employment and, and also in particular to highlight uh, the strategy that we have, have just launched uh, for consultation over the past uh, number of weeks uh, as well. And uh, I, I spoke alongside um, the uh, Irish Justice Minister and the Minister for Equality, um, Francis Fitzgerald, and there's a number of other uh, prominent speakers there too. Low for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, how do we compare with other regions uh, in these islands? Well, um, through a bizarre coincidence of timing, or maybe it was deliberate, who knows? Um, in the same week that uh, we launched our own uh, consultation exercise, um, on Taoiseach um, announced uh, an employment, uh, a disability employment strategy uh, for the Republic of Ireland uh, as, as well. So we see uh, on a north-south basis uh, a coming together uh, of the two jurisdictions in terms of similar uh, types of, of provision. And while we will remain separate in terms of implementation of those uh, respective uh, strategies, where there is any potential uh, for, for commonality, uh, for learning lessons on a, on a shared uh, basis, or indeed actually exploring opportunities uh, for, for placements or job opportunities uh, on, on a north-south basis, uh, then we will certainly take, take those up. We are also aware of developments that are happening elsewhere in the UK in terms of disability employment strategies. And while on a piecemeal basis we have seen a number of the, the, the elements that we are um, currently considering for Northern Ireland being introduced in other parts uh, of, of the UK, they are not yet at the stage where they are really encapsulating that as part of a, of a formal strategy, though I am sure that they will seek to do so in the very near future. Megan Farron. 
Kermagit, um, for your last kind of Can I ask the Minister for his assessment on how attractive it is for students from Nuri and Armagh to attend college in Louth, and indeed the same applies to the throughout the border region? Well, I, I would suggest that probably uh, it, it would depend upon the particular uh, level uh, of, of study. Um, certainly at levels 2, and level 3 and level 4, I would imagine that um, Southern Regional College would have a massive comparative advantage uh, in, in that regard. Um, we don't have huge evidence of a flow of students uh, from Northern Ireland uh, to, to the Republic for further, for further education or the equivalent of further education, but we, we do see a very significant flow of students in the opposite direction from, from the south uh, to, to, to the north. The, the bulk of that flow uh, would be um, in the Derry uh, North Donegal uh, corridor, where we have well in excess of two and a half thousand students uh, who are moving in, in that particular direction. The flow in terms of, of Newry and County Louth will be will be much smaller than that. Ms. Farron for a supplement. Graham, I get to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, can I ask him to outline what actions he intends to take in in the, in the near future um, around moving barriers to student mobility cross-border um, and exploring what barriers exist? Well, there's probably two, two separate issues in, in that regard. I mean, there is an issue as to what's happening in higher education, um, which has been the subject of quite a few questions in the Assembly recently. Um, in terms of further, ed further education, the, the main barrier in terms of flow from north to south is, that, is a lack of equivalent provision in many parts um, of, of the Republic of Ireland. That's what we're seeing, particularly in relation to the, uh, the Derry-Donegal uh, phenomenon, um, where we, we're seeing that migration uh, into North West Regional College because there is not any uh, significant provision at that level in, in County Donegal. And that's been a, an area that has been sadly neglected by the Irish Government over, over, over many years. There's a, a major cost that actually comes to us in Northern Ireland of around £7.5 million. Pounds that we're bearing every year um, that, that um, is, is the, the effect of this. That obviously comes at, the, at the, the detriment of our ability to invest that money in other parts of, of FE. And let me, to, be, to be clear, I'm not seeking to discourage students coming from the south. What we have to have is a natural flow in both directions to balance each, each other out. In turn, once we have that, colleges will then be able to specialise even more in terms of provision, which stands to benefit us, benefit us, uh, to, to us all, irrespective of which jurisdiction uh, we're starting from. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what progress is being made to provide more higher level apprenticeships to people in Northern Ireland as part of the Change Fund? Well, as the member uh, will appreciate, as part of the, the Northern Ireland Apprenticeship Strategy, um, we are committed to piloting the higher level apprenticeships and have secured a package of £7.5 million pounds, uh, from the executive for both that and also some piloting in relation uh, to uh, youth training. Um, at this stage, we are we're looking to potentially around 450 uh, higher level apprenticeships uh, across uh, 10 different occupational areas, uh, starting in, in terms of this current um, ac academic year. Uh, all six of our colleges have engaged in, in this process, as well as our uh, universities. And of a total of 30 applications that have been made, um, we have 27 of those uh, approved uh, by my department. Um, the list itself includes areas such as uh, me um, mechatronics, engineering, uh, insurance, food manufacturing and, and computing, and a full list is available in terms of my, uh, the, the NI Direct uh, website. Well, Mr Little, first supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer, and I, I welcome the progress that is, is being made in the provision of higher level apprenticeships. Can I ask the Minister just how important uh, improving that provision of higher level apprenticeships is to the transformation of the Northern Ireland economy? Well, the, the key point here is that um, we, we have very clear evidence of the importance of higher, high level skills and having a much greater footprint in terms of, hi, of higher level skills. However, we are not going to achieve that fully through the more traditional um, higher education um, ac academic route. While that will remain important, it is equally important that we seek to diversify the routes through which um, we are providing those higher level skills. And obviously, the apprenticeship model provides a different alternative, one that actually combines people being in a job while, while uh, learning at the same time, both on the job and also learning in terms of a college or a university. Uh, and indeed, that type of hybrid study, particularly at the higher levels, I think uh, will be something that's very lucrative for employers in terms of, of their um, having confidence that they're getting the, the qualified young people they need for the future growth of their business, and also for young people themselves, knowing that they have the employability skills that are very much prized uh, by employers, in addition to the, the professional and technical skills uh, that employers need as well. Well, Mr. Danny Kennedy. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister for his assessment uh, of the need to train more doctors and nurses in Northern Ireland uh, and outline how he and his department can encourage and assist with this? Well, the Member will know that those uh, workforce planning issues uh, are matters for the uh, Department uh, of Health uh, rather than directly for my uh, department uh, to, to be, be making. Uh, but uh, I, uh, like others, are very much aware of the, the pressures that are being experienced uh, within the health service, and I'm sure that the, the Health Minister um, is very much seized of, of those issues. Time, time, time is up. We now move on to questions to the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development. I call Mrs.